The human race is at a remarkable point in its development. For over 95% of our roughly 200,000 year history, our species existed as nomadic hunter-gatherers, living in small mobile groups that moved according to the availability of resources. Our survival was entirely dependent upon obtaining food through means of hunting, fishing, and foraging plants, nuts, fruits, and other edible resources. This lifestyle, which revolved around following the migration patterns of animals and the seasonal growth of plants, was not conducive to the establishment of permanent human settlements, as the constant movement that this way of life necessitated was prohibitive to their formation. This all changed about 10,000 years ago, when something truly remarkable happened, the development of agriculture. Instead of hunting and foraging for food, humans began to domesticate animals and cultivate crops, providing a stable and abundant food supply that allowed us to settle in one place, which in turn led to the establishment of permanent villages and towns. This shift, the agricultural revolution, laid the foundation for the rise of civilization by providing the necessary conditions for population growth, economic complexity, and technological innovation. It marked the beginning of a profound shift in human history, leading to the development of cities, countries, empires, and government, and setting the stage for further advancements in human society. The next seismic shift in the development of our species occurred roughly 200 years ago. It saw the invention of the steam engine, machinery, and industrial manufacturing, which in turn drove the widespread use of fossil fuels as an energy source. This shift, the Industrial Revolution, coincided with the birth of almost every technology that is today a cornerstone of our everyday lives. Everything that we take for granted today, such as electricity, telephones, cameras, automobiles, airplanes, refrigerators, computers, and space travel, are byproducts of this transformative shift. You might be wondering what any of this has to do with whether we're alone in the universe, but these two major evolutionary transitions underline the reality of the exponential progression of our technology as a species. For over 95% of humanity's history, civilization had yet to emerge, and only in the last 0.1% of the amount of time our species has existed did we industrialize and develop high technology. That means that in less than the last 5% of human history, did we go from spear-throwing, hut-building hunter-gatherers to developing the technology to land on the moon. Not only does this contextualize the exponential pace of our technological growth, but it also puts into perspective just how recent these developments are on a cosmological timescale. This conundrum is central to the Fermi paradox, as if the universe is 13.8 billion years old and contains an incomprehensible number of planets with the potential for life to evolve, then why do humans, having only existed for an infinitesimal fraction of time relative to the age of the universe, see no evidence of any other intelligent life in the cosmos? Ray Kurzweil, an American futurist who studies the exponential growth of technology, put it best in an interview he did with Robert Kahn in 2013. My, my thinking is colored by the realization that technology proceeds exponentially. And from the very first stirrings of communication, where in 1850 the fastest way of sending a message was the Pony Express, to where just a few centuries later we will have sublime uh, methods of communication and we will expand our own intelligence with non-biological intelligence. And that only takes a few centuries. And the realization that if this sort of common SETI assumption were true, and there were millions of these civilizations out there, well, you know, many of them would be ahead of us. And they wouldn't be ahead of us by, you know, 20 years or 50 years. They'd be ahead of us by millions of years. And if they're only ahead of us by a thousand years, they would have already taken over their galaxies and be and have galaxy-wide intelligence and be trillions of times more intelligent than we are, etc. And it'd be hard to imagine we wouldn't notice them, and we, and yet we have we d we don't notice them at all. And the people say, well, it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. But a, a civilization like that would be putting out trillions of trillions of needles, which is to say, intelligent signals, and it'd be hard to imagine we wouldn't notice any of them. The conclusion that Ray arrives at by the end of the interview is that it's likely we're the only example of sentient technology-based life in the observable universe, as once a civilization hits our stage of development, it becomes highly improbable that others are ahead. The reasoning behind this is that within just another few millennia, humans, or more likely AI, which is poised to succeed us, will already be engaging in galaxy-wide expansion and engineering, producing visible technosignatures as a byproduct of this activity. Even if we assume Ray's estimate is off by several orders of magnitude, 
and it takes millions rather than thousands of years for technological civilizations to take over their galaxies? This still constitutes an incredibly brief period in the grand timeline of the universe. After all, intelligent life with a head start of just a few million years would be vastly more advanced than we are, and should be leaving unmistakable traces of its presence. And yet we see nothing. The universe appears untouched, like a virgin forest that is yet to be marked by the presence of human exploitation. By this logic, we can effectively rule out the existence of any other intelligent life evolving prior to humans, as it would have already expanded across a large portion of the observable universe. Acknowledging this, it also becomes extremely improbable that any other civilizations evolved after us either, as if it took 13.8 billion years for the universe to produce a single example of intelligence, then the likelihood of it emerging multiple times within just 200,000 years is astronomically low. Of course, one must consider the speed of light as a significant factor in this context, as the light that we currently observe from distant regions of the universe could predate the evolution of other civilizations entirely. However, for this to significantly decrease our ability to detect them, they would need to be far enough away that the light from their location would take a substantial fraction of the universe's age to reach us. This is because even when observing distant galaxies millions of light years away, they still would have had billions of years for intelligent life to evolve, making the probability of detecting evidence of it very high if it exists, regardless of whether we see these areas as they were millions of years ago. However, when we look out billions of light years, this dynamic changes radically. The light we see from these areas takes so long to reach us that we're observing them as they were much earlier in the universe's history when there would have been significantly less time for the evolution of intelligent life, dramatically increasing the probability that any light we see would precede its development. But there's a problem with this line of reasoning. If technological life is so rare that it's spread out across billions of light years, this implies only a handful of occurrences throughout the entire universe. Through sheer probability, this then makes it much more likely that other examples of it don't exist at all, rather than being limited to only a few dozen instances in our universe's history. At first glance, this seems nearly inconceivable, given the fact that there are an estimated 100 septillion planets within our observable universe, many of which have existed for far longer than our own. While we can't infer too much from the evolution of life on Earth without falling prey to observation selection bias, this much we do know. Despite the billions of species that have emerged over our planet's history, only one of them, humans, ever went on to develop technology. This is despite the fact that convergent evolution commonly occurs as physical adaptations like eyes or wings have evolved independently in different species from divergent evolutionary lineages. We also know that many other types of animals like dolphins, octopi, and corvids seem to possess high levels of intelligence, and to some extent even have the capacity for self-awareness. This suggests that the development of technology involves not only high intelligence, but also the ability for a species to create tools and manipulate its environment, alongside having a compelling reason to do so. This last point is particularly relevant with regard to humans, as we seem to be unique in the sense that we evolved with the absence of any natural defense mechanism. Unlike other species, we are not particularly fast, strong, or equipped with sharp teeth or claws that serve as effective means of protection. This vulnerability likely created a strong evolutionary pressure to develop alternative means of hunting and defense, and served as the impetus for the creation of early technologies. For example, in order to compensate for their physical shortcomings, early humans began creating simple tools. Stones and sticks were fashioned into spears, which allowed us to hunt animals that were too fast or strong to catch and kill with our bare hands. Each new tool represented an improvement in the ability to hunt, defend, and gather resources more effectively. This set us on a course of continuous technological innovation. The invention of metalworking led to more powerful tools and weapons. The wheel and eventually the internal combustion engine enabled humans to move faster with cars than any animal can run. The development of planes allowed us to fly faster than the quickest birds. The creation of firearms let us exceed the natural offensive capabilities of any other animal, allowing us to kill even the most powerful creatures from a safe distance. Ironically enough, it was our lack of any strong biological defense adaptations that led to the sophisticated technologies we have today, which in turn allowed us to surpass the natural abilities of any other species. In so many words, humans evolved maladapted to our environment, so we learned to adapt our environment to us. This is known as the rare technology hypothesis, which states that in the absence of a strong evolutionary impetus, even a sufficiently intelligent species would have no incentive to pursue the development of technology. Upon observation, this appears to be a convincing solution to the Fermi paradox, as the conditions that would give rise to technology 
appear to have converged in humans through a highly specific evolutionary pathway. But there's a counter-argument to this thesis, which is that once the first plants and animals emerged on Earth, our species evolved in relatively short order. This somewhat weakens the argument that humans are an evolutionary anomaly, because if technical intelligence rarely evolves, then why did it emerge so quickly following the appearance of multicellular life? There are also reasons to believe that the transition from simple bacteria to multicellularity was a much larger barrier than the jump from primitive animals to something like ourselves. The most compelling factor in favor of this assertion is that it took nearly 4 billion years, or roughly three quarters of our planet's history, for the evolution of multicellular organisms, followed by only 600 million years for the first technological species to emerge. On a cosmological timescale, one of those events spanned over a quarter of the universe's history, while the other constitutes less than 5%. To lend further credence to this argument, the conditions surrounding the development of multicellular life remain shrouded in uncertainty. Furthermore, one of the key milestones that is considered a prerequisite for its emergence is widely considered unlikely to have ever occurred in the first place. This development, the transition from prokaryotic to eukaryotic life, required a confluence of extremely improbable events and took longer than any other single evolutionary step in the history of life on Earth. The development of the first eukaryotes, or eukaryogenesis, likely occurred when a bacterium engulfed an archaea, but then instead of digesting it, the two organisms formed a symbiotic relationship. This then allowed the archaea to start producing energy for the bacterium, which in turn allowed for the evolution of much greater cellular complexity. To underscore how statistically improbable it was for this process to occur, imagine a snake swallowing a mouse, and instead of the mouse being killed by the snake and digested, it starts permanently living inside the snake's body, providing a service such as enhanced digestion or energy production. Over time, the mouse becomes an essential part of the snake's biology, to the point where the snake cannot survive without it and vice versa. This would require both the snake and mouse to undergo significant changes to integrate their biological functions seamlessly, similar to how the bacterium's genes were transferred to the host archaea's genome. The fact that this required a highly improbable convergence of compatible organisms, favorable environmental conditions, and evolutionary processes that allowed for the establishment and success of this symbiotic relationship means that even if these conditions were to be replicated, there's no guarantee that eukaryogenesis would ever occur again. And so far, it hasn't. In fact, some astrobiologists have concluded that eukaryogenesis may be so rare that the average amount of time it would take to occur likely exceeds the current age of the universe. This makes it a prime candidate for the solution to the Fermi paradox, as without the transition from prokaryotic to eukaryotic life, bacteria and single-celled organisms never could have evolved into the complex life forms that exist today. However, even before the emergence of eukaryotes and the transition to multicellularity, there was another more fundamental, and perhaps even less well-understood process that occurred, the initial spark of life itself. This is referred to as abiogenesis, the process through which life arises from non-living material. On Earth, this occurred roughly 3.5 billion years ago, or around 500 million years after the formation of our planet. It is possible that the conditions that facilitated this process were exceptionally unique. Factors such as the planet's distance from the sun, the presence of liquid water, a suitable atmosphere, stable climate, and a rich chemical environment were all crucial. Every one of these conditions was dependent upon a delicate balance of astrophysical, geological, and chemical factors. The so-called Goldilocks zone, where a planet is neither too hot nor too cold for liquid water to exist, was just one part of this complex equation. The precise combination of these conditions may be so uncommon that it occurs in only a tiny fraction of planetary systems. Moreover, the path from simple organic molecules to primitive life involved numerous steps, each with its own improbabilities. Even if a planet has conditions that are conducive for the emergence of life, the precise sequence of chemical reactions that would allow it to emerge could be highly contingent on specific local circumstances. The improbability of these exact conditions aligning perfectly may mean that the window for life to emerge is extremely narrow. If this is true, then it would negate the argument that abiogenesis is unlikely to be exceedingly rare, due to the fact that it occurred almost as soon as the conditions on Earth allowed it to. It could be that only a very transient period early in our planet's history presented favorable circumstances for life to emerge, and we just got extremely lucky that it was able to arise within this brief window of time. This very well may be true, as while abiogenesis did occur relatively quickly, the current evidence we have suggests that it happened only once in our planet's history, as the prevailing scientific view was that all known life on Earth shares a common ancestor, which suggests a single origin of life. However, 
We cannot definitively say that this rules out the possibility that abiogenesis occurred multiple times, as if other instances did occur, they either did not survive or were outcompeted by the life forms descending from the successful origin. I'd like to emphasize, however, that when looking back at the history of life on Earth, it's easy, perhaps too easy, to focus in on a particular evolutionary milestone and then ascribe the Fermi Paradox to improbable circumstances that surrounded it. But the truth is that without being able to rewind the clock and watch evolution play out over a divergent set of conditions, there's no real way to assign a level of probability to any given event occurring. It could be that any one of these candidates is the solution to the Fermi Paradox. It could be something else entirely. It could be, perhaps most likely, a combination of them all. However, for all the uncertainty surrounding these questions, this much we can say. That if we truly are as unique as the nature of our existence suggests, and are perhaps the only example of sentient technology-based life within the visible universe, then a tremendous burden has been placed on our collective shoulders. For all the arguing we humans do, it's easy to lose sight of just how special our species really is just here on Earth. And contrary to what most believe, even on a scale that's likely cosmological, it's terrifying to confront the possibility that if we screw up and go extinct, that that's it, we're alone. There isn't anyone coming to save us. There aren't billions of other civilizations out there like our own waiting in the wings. We'd be nothing more than an anomaly, a blip on the universe's radar of history. I think it's up to us, and only us, to prove that the experiment of intelligent life isn't an evolutionary dead end, or a misadaptation. Whether we view this as daunting or inspiring is up to us to decide, but in the vast expanse of the cosmos, our actions today could echo through eternity, defining not just our fate, but the legacy of intelligence itself. Thank you all for watching. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, and stay posted for new content, and I'll catch you soon.